All right, in this video, we are going to discuss Newton's method. Uh, short version is, back in the day before graphing calculators were invented, figuring out the root of an equation was a lot more difficult than it is now because with graphing calculators and the computer algebra systems, we can use intersect features, we can just say solve, and they will give us what looks like the answer. Well, in reality, calculators don't actually give you answers we've seen that they give you approximations to answers. And so Newton's method is really what our main topic today is, how do calculators do math? You use the intersect feature of a calculator. What is it doing? You use the solve feature of your computer algebra system. What is it doing? And so that's what we're going to look at doing. We will use Newton's method to approximate the root of an equation and also to approximate the nth root of a number. And so before we start looking at uh, any kind of examples, you have to understand the, the basic outline behind what's going on, what is it trying to do. You have to understand what Newton's method actually is. And so we'll focus on the geometric understanding before we start doing it algebraically. So here we go. Here's our picture what is the number r? Of course we can see r is an x-intercept, that's our root. What is the number? Well, the basic idea behind this one is if we were looking at it and saying 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we're obviously not going to say, well, r is 12. We can see that it's going to be somewhere between 3 and 4. And so Newton's method is take a blind guess. Guess some number that's kind of close to it. For example, if we took our first guess, x1, to be a 4, we would be able to plug this into the function and get the height, f of x1. What we would do from there is take the linearization, take a tangent line essentially, and say with blue, we've got our tangent line, it comes down and it's going to intersect the x-axis. Wherever it's hitting the x-axis, that is now our x2. And I don't know what that number is, so I'm going to make up a number that looks like it's closer. For example, maybe we wind up with 3.5. Well, we can take our x2, come up, get its height, which would give us here, and then we'll take the tangent at that point, and we wind up getting x3. You see how this iterative process is closing in on r? If we were to come up and say, here is f of x3, the third, the height of our third approximation, and take its tangent, we're getting closer still. Basically, you just repeat this process. Guess a number, get its height, get its tangent, wherever that's crossing the x-axis, that's the next one we will use get that height, get that tangent, then use the next one. Get that one, and so on and so forth. You just use this iterative process, and by repeating this over and over, you can get closer and closer and closer. I would like to point out, though, if you have a really crappy guess, this might not work. In particular, let's say that this is a function that then curves outward, like that. And we say, I'm going to guess 12. Hooray! And so I get straight up. And I have my tangent line. And I wind up with a number that's like, hooray, it's all the way over at negative 50. Depending on what's going on over on the other side, for all I know, this could actually have terminated right there. And this line goes outside the domain. So, quick point behind it, make sure you actually do pick something that's a reasonable guess. 
because if you don't pick something that's at least ballpark close, a lot of times this process will be crap and it'll fail and it gives you all kinds of stuff that's useless. Depending on this type of function, depending on how bad your guess is, it might wind up going off into complete garbage. And usually, if you encounter complete garbage, you recognize it pretty quickly, and then you just say you have to start over. So please be aware. Make a good first guess, but that doesn't mean use the calculator to get the first guess either. Just be reasonable. So pausing right now, this iterative process with the picture, did it make sense? Okay, I'm seeing people nodding heads yes and other people with blank stares, so I'm not sure how to make of that. Process, was it there? Well, that iterative process, again, is called Newton's method. Obviously, the guy who created it, Isaac Newton. But we'd like to be able to have a piece that would allow us to have a formula we could use. And so we're going to take a moment to kind of solve this piece right here. And you'll note, starting off, we have the general equation of a line. But y1, that height of y1, came by plugging in f. So we're just going to say f of x1 instead of y1, which is where we got this piece. The slope of the line came from the tangent. And so slope of a tangent line we know is the derivative, so we plugged in slope with the derivative at the point x1. Okay, so do you see where the second equation came from? To continue this, we are going to say our x-intercept is based on the linearization, and specifically our x2 is coming from the point x2, 0. Because remember, x2 was saying it's this point right there on the x-axis. And so what we're going to replace then, instead of saying x and y, we're going to say x2 and 0, giving us this piece, 0 minus f of x1 equals f prime of x1 times x2 minus x1. Well, of course, 0 minus, we could just say, is a negative. And all we're going to do now is solve this so that we have x2 equals blob. By solving it so that we have x2 equals blob, it will give us a way to find out what's the next number in the process. So distribute across. We have f prime of x1 times x2 minus x1 times f prime of x1. Well, if we just add this to both sides, we would then wind up with x1 times f prime of x1 minus, I'm sorry, f prime, f prime, minus f of x1 equals f prime of x1 times x2. And so dividing out, you'll note then we'd have x2 is equal to x1 times f prime of x1 over f prime of x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. And those pieces cancel out, which sets us up with our formula x2 equals x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. And so we have now a formula. Instead of needing to actually plug all the pieces into the equation at the top and then do this algebra based on numbers, 
we've created a formula that will let you know if you have your initial guess, x1, you can plug it into the function. You will also need the derivative and plug your guess into the derivative. Put those pieces together in this way and it will tell you what your next number should be. This is a piece that we are going to use a lot of with the calculators just to speed up the number crunching because frankly, number crunching is slow. Doing all this by hand is dumb and pointless. Again, this is how do calculators do this quickly. We're going to slow down the calculator work, use this formula to show how calculators are actually doing the work behind the scenes. But that doesn't mean that we're going to be doing all the number crunching by hand. That would take a long time, and frankly, we're not Isaac Newton. He had more time on his hands being a professional mathematician. You guys have homework. You have volleyball and a life, other classes, and so. But this formula, would there be anything different if we said, now that we have x2, go right back up to the beginning and say, do this over with x2? and x3 to get the next one, it's the exact same process. All we would do is change 1s to 2s and change x2 to x3, and we've got the exact same result again. So more generally, it's not just x2 and x1, it's xn and xn plus 1. I would recommend that at the top of your homework, you write this formula down because this is what you will use on every single homework in this section. Every single homework problem. Our formula, x to the n plus 1, so the next one is based on the current, subtract the function value and the function values of the derivative. So how does it get used? we will use an initial guess of x1 equals 1. Find the third approximation of the equation x cubed plus 4x minus x minus 2 equals 0. Want to heavily note, equals 0 means we're searching for a root. Therefore, all the algebra and graph stuff that we were just doing apply. If it's not equal 0, then this stuff, we have to do some adjustments to make it equal 0. Well, remember our formula, x to the n plus 1, and that's a little bit too tall for a subscript, equals x to the n minus f of x to the n over f prime x to the n. Well, we already have our function. We can see f of x is x cubed plus 4x minus x minus 2 what is its derivative? So 4 minus 1 would be plus 3. Simplifying it a little bit. And we know that we could do the same thing up here and have written plus 3x instead of plus 4x minus x. It's perfectly fine to simplify if it's appropriate. And so we have each of these pieces which now tells us x2 is going to be x1, which we had said is 1, minus 1 cubed plus 3x minus 2 over 3 times 1 squared plus 3. 3 Oh, yeah, I see what you said. 3 times x, which was 3 times 1. Thank you. And even then, we could type this directly into our calculator. We're not even going to type this stuff in the way that it appears here. Using our calculator, we could type in um, x minus, and then in parentheses, we had x cubed plus 3x, x to the third, plus 3x, minus 2, 
okay, divided by, for our denominator, we then had 3x squared plus 3. And you'll note we're just typing the formula into our calculator. But this is where the such that or the given feature is so nice because we can now say given that x equals our first guess gives us two thirds. Come right back up. So our iterative process is take that one. Two thirds was x2. Now we have x3. We're done. 70 over 117. So we would still want to say it's two thirds. And then we'd want to say x3 is then, what was it, 70 over 117? And we have our answer. Of course, we could also do this with a decimal approximation and say, this is about, but here's our initial piece. And we've got it, we're done. There's the third approximation. This process of how we just go back and plug them in is exactly what your calculator is doing. Whenever you use the solve feature, whenever you use like an intersect feature, this is in part what it's doing. Example two, and our last example. Use Newton's method to find two to the one fifth. So we want the fifth root of two, and we want it correct to eight decimal places. And so first off, we're looking at this piece. It's Newton's method applied to solving when something is equal to zero. That equals zero. So we need to set it up. Now, since all of this is based on the on having x1, x2, we have to have something that we can plug in for x. And so one potential guess that we could take is, say, have this piece be equal to the fifth root of x. But since this is based entirely on the idea that it must be equal to 0, so that way we have our roots for Newton's method, we could then subtract this piece over and say this is equal to zero. Of course, this is going to have the natural problem if we're doing it this way, that when we start plugging pieces in, we're still going to have the fifth root of two, and we don't know what that is. And so what we could wind up doing then is backtracking a little bit and saying, we're still working with this piece. But if we raise both of them to the fifth power, we can get rid of the radicals entirely and just say we have this type of piece. Well, in general, recognizing that I wasn't phrasing this particularly efficiently and that it was confusing, I'm backtracking a little bit to try to clarify. If we are looking for the fifth root of 2, we should be able to recognize that this is working backwards through a fifth power function. And so if we are looking at the fifth exponent, we could say subtract 2 equals 0. And please note, if we were going to go through and solve this equation, we'd be saying add 2, so we'd have x to the fifth equals 2, and then taking the fifth root, we wind up with this number that we are trying to approximate is the root of this function that I have written in black. Does that make more sense? Okay, I'm seeing a lot more head nodding, so moving forward with this piece, where this does for us is say, this is a piece that is our function, our f. We will need an initial guess. 
will pick a number that you think is somewhat close to the fifth root of two. Well, you can pick whatever you want. You don't know what it is, so I'm going to pick, how about one? I know one to the fifth is gonna be one, and I know two to the fifth is 32, so it's gotta be somewhere between, yeah, two to the fifth is 32. And so it's gotta be somewhere between one and two. Well, I'm just gonna pick the one that's a lot closer to it, so I'm picking one for my answer, although picking 1.1 would probably be fine. And so let's start by, we have our f, we need f prime of x. That's just 5x to the fourth. And so picking x1 to be a guess of 1, we will now plug this stuff back into our calculators and crunch the numbers. So we would have here x minus f of x, which was x to the fifth subtract 2. And that is divided by 5x to the fourth. Given that we're using the initial guess x equals 1. And we get 6 over 5. That tells us x2 equals 1.2. Okay, taking this piece right back in, given that we have x equals 1.2, tells us 1.1529. x3 equals 1.1529. Well, remember how the direction said we need this accurate to eight decimal places? How could we possibly know we're accurate to eight decimals when the calculator is only giving us four? It's a settings issue. We have to go into the settings and increase it so that it's eight decimals. And so using that part, menu, document, where are they? Settings and status, document settings, display digits is float six. Let's go float 10, telling us OK. And now we'll come back and say, that given that we had 1.1529, which is now giving us one point, where? Oh, 1.15, thank you for helping me with that. That would have, of course, changed things. 1.1529. So 1.14. X4 is 1.14. Okay, and so we're noting one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's nine decimal places. And so now we'll come back and say, calculator, the same piece. Given that x is equal to, and so we have 1.1486, 1.1486, Nine eight three five seven. Okay, and we'll have to do this again. How will I, will I know when we're done? One point one four eight six nine. One point one four eight six nine. Three five five eight three five five. How do I know when we're done? Well, the important thing worth noting there are the eight decimal places. 
are the same. So every single time I do this again, it's going to converge closer and closer to the actual real root, but they're already matching the first eight decimal places, so we're going to be okay. It is worth noting, though, this particular one is saying 7 is going to round up to 5. Do I know if this was like point four nine or 5? Basically, is this 5 supposed to round up or not? We don't know if this was actually rounded up to 5 itself. But either way, they're still matching. Even if this was rounded, they're matching at these 8 spots. So this is the root accurate to 8 decimal places. And so we have our answer. The square, the square root, the fifth root of 2 is about 1.14. Eight six nine eight three five, and we're not rounding that. We're truncating it because we want it accurate to that many decimal places. And there we go. That's Newton's method. Whatever the function is, we will need to set it up so that we have the function be equal to zero, and just use this formula repeatedly over and over and over. How do you show your work then? Well, same way that I had here. Write down your list. X1, you took the guess, which leads you to X2, which leads you to, and you write down as many as you need. But all the work is done, being done by the calculator. Just make sure you're recording what the calculator is doing. So, all things considered, do you know what Newton's method is? You should understand the basic process that's being done with the iterative graphing and be able to use the formula to be able to approximate the root of equation and approximate the nth root of a number.